Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I was assistant director in Hollywood for the better part of eight years, and now I'm not. Today's episode is going to be a little different than our normal format. Rather than talk about a specific movie or TV show, we're going to discuss the 48-hour film project. For those who are not aware, the 48-hour film project is a nationwide event where teams over the course of a weekend write, shoot, and edit a short film. You can learn more about the program at their website, 48hourfilm.com. My guests today participated in the Washington, D.C. event, which took place last May. Their film, The Will, is only six minutes long. You can watch the film yourself at vimeo.com. There's a link. You put vimeo.com backslash 3414-73209. Once again, go to vimeo.com backslash 3414-73209. I'll also post a link on Facebook. You can find it at Podcast Below the Line. And I'll distribute the link via Twitter and Instagram. If you're not already following us there, you can find us at Pod Below the Line. Okay, first up, Andrea Milescu, you were the producer, director, and writer. Welcome to Below the Line. Thank you, Skid. Thank you for having me. Andrea, tell us what you do in real life. I work for the State Department on foreign policy issues. We're glad you're with us here today to talk more about your film. Next... Brooke Cranford, you are the assistant director, job close to my heart, and the music composer for the film. Brooke, welcome. Thank you, Skid. It's great to be talking with you today. And Brooke, what do you do in real life? I also work with, uh, at the State Department on uh, policy issues. Okay, the State Department is well represented today. Our third guest, uh, Quentin Regal, you are the editor of the film. Quentin, That's welcome. That's right. Thank you. Hey, but what do you do in real life? We'll answer the same question. Well, I'm lucky enough to be retired. I retired uh, last January from a legal job with the uh, uh, Trade Association in Washington. And now I'm spending more time doing films. Well, let's get right into that. Let's, for our listeners, again, who are not familiar with the 48-hour film festival overall, let's talk about how the festival is organized. Sure. So the festival is organized. It's a 48 hour film project and I believe they have about a hundred plus cities around the world where they film. I believe they are represented in like six countries. The goal is to put a movie together in 48 hours. So on Friday you write and you brainstorm, on Saturday you shoot, and on Sunday you, you edit. But as the team knows, it's not really a 48-hour film project. It's a lot of coordinating and work beforehand. But the film, the production itself, and a little bit, of, and the post-production is all done in 48 hours. And so, at the very beginning, I understand you draw out of a hat to get uh, elements of what the film is going to be or the genre. Tell me more about that. How it starts. That is correct. I, um, they have a, a group together of the representative of each of the teams on Friday night where they meet sometime between 5 and 7 p.m. Quinton was our representative this time, and he drew our genre out of the hat, and our genre was either comedy or road movie. And so then while Quinton was um, drawing our genre out of the hat, I was with the team back at my house, and we were waiting with bated breath to hear what genre we had. And we were gonna start brainstorming as soon as Quentin phoned in or texted in our genre. And he texted in the genre and we started brainstorming. And the goal was to brainstorm for a couple of hours and everybody be done before 10 p.m. with the brainstorming. Quentin joined us for the brainstorming session. So he immediately drove from the Georgetown location to my house um, in Mount Pleasant. And we started brainstorming and then everybody left by 10 o'clock and I continued to write based on how we outlined our script. We threw a lot of ideas. We, um, I, am, as a, I am not talented in writing comedy, but we did draw comedy and road movie. So we went with road movie. We threw a lot of ideas, um, some on comedy, some on road movie. And I ended up picking Road Movie, and it's about a will, and it's a, a subject that I can relate to. If you watch, I won't, I won't give any too, too many spoilers, but if you watch it, it's a, it's a subject that I have familiarity with. My grandmother passed away, and there was, a, there was a controversial will situation in my family, but it wasn't quite as dramatic as the film, so there was a lot of embellishing in the film. And That's good. I'm I, glad to hear that your personal experience was not quite <laughs> as dramatic as how the, how the short film plays out. That's probably good. 
Yeah, no, it was not that dramatic, thank goodness. And I continued to write about until 2 a.m. And I uh, even had a conference call with you. I think you were out in L.A. watching a game or you were out <laughs> at an event. And you took some time to speak with me and, and go over my, uh, my script. And I continued to write until 2 a.m. And then had to wake up by 5 a.m. so I could meet the team so we can start shooting at bright and, bright and early at 8 a.m. Uh, the next day. Yeah, uh, that's that's fair to say. I should mention I did not work with you guys on this on the short film, but I did act in sort of an informal <laughs> advisor capacity as you guys were pulling things together. You know, let's take a step back from what you said. You talked about how yes, the actual event is forty eight hours, but a lot of work goes in before that as far as getting ready. Talk to me more about that. We'll we'll talk more about the will. We're going to dive in depth on the film itself, and yes, there will be spoilers, folks. Again. Uh, Go watch it on Vimeo if you haven't already. But uh, let's first talk about how this team came together. It was about a month out before the project started. And I first started with a, with a friend. And that friend alerted me to this, uh, to this 48 hour film festival. I started writing screenplays last year and I really enjoyed it. And I had a table read and my friend said, I'm a good writer. And she said, she'd love to help. She'd love to work with me. And, I have project management experience and I could pull teams together. And so she and I didn't work out for um, one reason or, or another, but I really liked the idea of the project. And I said, I want to do this. And I asked a few friends and Brooke wanted, Brooke could join me and a couple of others from other circles who are also on the team. And then figuring out how to recruit people and go to networking events and advertise. And I learned a lot about advertising and putting together a little poster and posting it on various uh, local DC film sites. And I didn't know what sites to go to. So I had to talk to a lot of different film friends who have done this before. And everybody was very helpful in, in terms of telling me where to go and providing me with like good lists of, of websites. I, I put that together and just distributed it. Um, met Quentin at one of the uh, networking events and Quentin at the time was I believe uh, editors are in high commodity and uh, three people were three teams were trying to recruit him and I was one of the teams and I have never done one of these pro projects before and I have not done a DC 40 hour film festival or have even directed or produced anything but I was really trying to pitch him on the fact that I'm a good screenwriter and I could put teams together and I don't know what sold him but I ended up working with him and I'm really grateful for that. <laughs> Quinn, that's Thank a good you. segue over to you Quinn so yeah. tell, us a little more, tell me a little bit more about your background with the film festival projects in general. Sure. Well, let me just say that was a big surprise at that networking event when so many people came up to me asking for, you know, an editor. Uh, it was uh, it was a nice situation to be in because I could choose, uh, you know, the team that I thought uh, was not only going to do a good job on the film, but also had the possibility of working on future projects. That's really what I wanted to do to create relationships and to network with people that are going to continue to do this in the future. Uh, my background, I'm a retired lawyer, but uh, when I was a kid, my father made a bunch of home movies, story movies uh, with the family. And so we all got the bug to, to participate in that. And I made my first little movie uh, uh, called The UFO when I was about 12. Uh, since then, I've taken some courses at Prince George's Community College, camera work and studio production. And I've started doing um, uh, some cable TV shows. I did a talk show and pr producing them and directing them. And then I saw this 48-hour film project, and it's it's very interesting. It's it's fairly new. It's only about 20 years old, but now it's 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 blown up internationally. Uh, it's a competition, and so I thought I'd give it a try. And so, uh, the, well, last year I produced a film, first time, novice, never done it before. And so I got together the cast and crew. And the thing that really worked in D.C. with the coordinators that handle the D.C. 48-hour project is the networking um, activities that they promote. They, they set up, oh, probably last year, probably five or six events. Um, this year, I only needed one to find a team, but I'm sure they had other events too. And it's a great way to find people who are looking for each other. So that's how I got involved, and that's how we teamed up. Well, that's interesting. Now, Brooke, for you, you and Andrea both work at the State Department. Were you 
friends, colleagues? Did you have an interest in film before this? How did, how did you join the team? So I would say we're, we were more friends than colleagues. Sometimes we go indoor rock climbing together and she's talking about doing the 48 hour film festival. And here I go on about how, oh yeah, I've worked on film projects before uh, for my previous work jobs. And, but it was really more about creating ideas for marketing campaigns. But then she's like, oh, well you should join me for this and be my AD or assistant director, which I, I had really no idea what the responsibilities of an AD was. I mean, it's clearly the hardest job on any set. Everyone knows (laughs) that this is the most important and most difficult job. (laughs) I did not know that at the time. (laughs) She's like, yeah, it's basically you manage the paperwork and make sure the, the filming is on time. You just make sure we're on schedule. And I was like, Oh, I can, we can probably do that. I'm, you know, I've managed projects before. And so I said, sure, really not completely understand what I was getting myself into, but I'm so glad I did say yes. I learned a lot, but even I, even for the first film, I walked away saying I still did not do everything that I felt like I should have. I should have researched a little more, but it worked out. I think she she invited me back for another project as well. <laughs> so now now you're now, now you're in that role. Well, besides the three of you, how many other folks participated with the team? Uh, well, for the crew, we had two uh, camera guys, a sound editor. There was Quentin with the in the editing room, um, Brooke as AD, and Brooke also composed a couple of um, couple of tunes for the will and then we had the cast and there were four speaking roles and two extras. Okay, well let's talk more about the film itself. So you talked about you you write it overnight. Talk about what the filming schedule was to pull the film together in 48 hours. Or again at this point how many hours do you have left? About 36 at this point, right? If we're counting down. That is correct. 36. There wasn't much sleep. Uh, I slept a few hours on Friday night, and then on Saturday, bright and early, 8 a.m., we start. Uh, Quentin is getting the um, the drone ready, and I get there, and he's playing with the drone, and the camera guy is setting up, and we, we go ahead and we shoot all day, and we start with our first location, a set of train tracks uh, in pre-production, which is you're not allowed to do anything in pre-production in terms of thinking about storylines, or anything that you're going to with involved with the creative aspects of the film. The only thing you're allowed to do is identify your cast, crew, and locations, which is very hard if you have locations. And we had our main theme was a pony farm or a horse farm. And your your whole creativity has to surround that pony farm. And your 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 topics can range from horror to comedy to um, road movie to any number of mockumentary to any number of things. So you're, you're, you have to be very creative in terms of, of your content. And we shot at five locations, but we had to scrap one. Um, apparently there was, we shot, so we first started off with the train tracks. Thank goodness they weren't live train tracks. Quentin assured me that they were not live, that he has gone there many times. But Brooke heard yeah. trains, and every time she heard trains, she told us to immediately get off the train tracks because she was afraid that a train was coming. But Quinton assured us that there were no trains coming. And I heard that a couple of months ago, there was an article about somebody who got killed, uh, an indie filmmaker, because there was a death involving somebody who was filming on a train tracks. So um, I was alerted to that uh, before we started before we started filming. Fortunately, nobody was hurt in, in the filming, and the train tracks were not live. And there were no trains in the end. There were no there trains. were no trains, at least not on those tracks. And then we proceeded to uh, to the restaurant where was our our second location. But we had a little area in the back, and we set up. Corey, our sound editor, said that he had noise in the background when he was listening in and. But we just decided to shoot. We didn't know if we were going to, the camera guy said, um, Manuel said we can go back to my place and shoot at my place, the the scene that was supposed to be shot at the restaurant. And it would have made better sense to shoot that scene, which is actually the lawyer scene where the lawyer is informing his two clients that their father just passed away. So it would have made better sense because I had a little office space to shoot at my place. But Quentin knew the 
the restaurant and he shot there last year. So we thought we had a good in and a good network, but things didn't quite work out with the, uh, with the restaurant because of the noise. But we proceeded to shoot as if we were going to use that scene because we weren't sure how long the day would last or if we would be able to finish on time and then continued to our next scene and then the pony farm and then went to Quentin's house for the, for the green screen. And then we did, it was about six o'clock or seven o'clock. And then right after the green screen, Quentin did not come with me back to my house. We decided that we had a few extra hours. The cast was very energized and they wanted to get it right. The actors were, um, they, they said, no, we want to get this right. We would rather do it right and have something good than, than have something bad and be unhappy with it. And so we went back to my place and Quentin stayed at his place and he started editing and, and doing his thing. And I said to him, well, I will come back and I will drive to your place with the hard drive, the thumb drive, and we will, we will do the editing as we will start the editing and then he could do what he needed to do while we were filming that last scene. And so um, that worked out in terms of logistics and we ended up, we wrapped uh, around eight or nine o'clock at night that day. So it was a 12 hour day. Short Very time. reasonable in film terms. Wow, only 12 hours of filming, huh? That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I hear. I'd like to interject a little bit because she talked about how, how the, you know, the crew and the, the cast and crew were just excited and, and still energized, even though we'd been filming for a while. And I just want to point, I really like the way Andrea put the team together. We had meetings before we even started this process. We had met each other, at least, I guess, at least a couple times uh, just to get to know each other, to maybe brainstorm ideas and scene locations. Um, and so her ability to really integrate people and put them together that previously had never worked with each other, di didn't know each other, uh, really led to just the excitement, camaraderie, and overall a successful project. Well, thank you, Brooke. That's very generous of me to say. <laughs> I will note that it was a very hot day and the, we had a car scene and we, the actors were sweating profusely because we couldn't have their car turned on because of the noise during the shoot and so Brooke was standing there with paper towels and every moment we took a break <laughs> Brooke was patting them down <laughs> <laughs> another uh, another of your unheralded responsibilities Brooke as the assistant director on set it sounds like so you guys said you shot green screen that's the yeah. interior car work is that right yeah that was a little tricky we um we set it up uh in my driveway had the car parked there and we set the green screen up behind the car shooting through the front windshield, but that didn't work because the windshield had too much reflection on it. And then so we did all the rest of the shots through the side windows rolled down with the green screen behind it. And fortunately, that would have been a disaster if we didn't do this, but fortunately after we took the first uh, set of shots, uh, we carted them upstairs to the editing room and tried it out to see if the green screen worked. And it didn't. <laughs> there, was, there was a lot of bleeding over the, because the green screen was too close to the actors. It was making their faces green. And so we just moved it back about four or five feet and took away the problem, tried it again. It worked beautifully. It was incredible how well the green screen worked. After yeah, that. I guess that would have been a problem if not to know, but thank goodness you guys were so close to you could check it right away and, and see how that comes together. Mm-hmm. Now then, so that was your Saturday film, and you filmed again on Sunday. Is that right? Still a couple of a couple of scenes, or that was the entire that was the, you shot everything in one day on Saturday. Yeah, I did go day. I did go back to the railroad tracks and take another shot, uh, aerial shot of the uh, tracks because the first one didn't come out very well. Uh, using your drone, you went and picked up did another pickup on that to edit yeah. in. I yeah. think I think um, Andrea and Quentin need to talk a little bit about the editing that happened. Uh, late on Saturday night and how someone fell asleep on the couch. <laughs> I did not fall asleep. I, do I was about to doze off. Corey and Quentin were in the editing room and they were editing. It was, I think, around 11 o'clock at night. I had slept only a couple of hours the night before and um, Corey turned around and he says, are you falling asleep? I said, no, no, I'm sleeping with my eyes open. <laughs> And yes. so um, Quentin said, uh, you know, I have two extra bedrooms. We, we could all just sleep here. And that was very nice of him because Quentin lives about 45 minutes away from my house. 
and it probably would have not been a good idea for me to go drive home. And so we spent the night at Quinton's house and I think we continued to work until like 1.30 in the morning and then woke up bright and early, somewhere around seven or eight, and then we proceeded to start all over again with the editing. Yeah, I had done I had done a movie called Believer last year, and we couldn't get the editing transferred to the the first editor that we had uh, um, roped into doing it. Uh, we tried to do it electronically, and it was just too slow a process. Plus, when we did get it, the, the audio didn't come through. So I had to do all the editing all night, Saturday night. And by seven o'clock the next morning, I was starting to, maybe not hallucinating, but I was getting really drowsy. And I had a whole day to go to finish up the editing and everybody came to the house and was helping with the editing and credits and everything, music. Uh, and I vowed at that point never to let that happen again. So we, we knocked off at 1.30 uh, in, in Will and uh, picked it up again at seven. That made a huge difference. And when was the film due? When did you have to turn it back in? I'm thinking, is it Sunday night then? Is that the end of your 48 Sunday hours? Sunday night at 7.30. The, uh, they give the, the uh, every film has three required elements. You have to have a character whose name and occupation you're given. You have to have a line of dialogue. So you can't write any of this in advance. And uh, you have to have a, a, an object of some kind. In this case, it was a uh, tape. So yeah, so let's. Uh, so you had. So you had tape was your object, and that was in every single film is going to have tape in it. Is that right? right. And then what was the line you guys had to use? There is no I in will. Um, uh, no, there is no. I There's in actually team. there is an I in will. <laughs> there is no I in team. <laughs> oh, so, sorry. So there, there, you had to you had to use the line in every film again. There is no I in team. Right. Okay, and then uh, what was the character and occupation you had to use? Was Kate Paltran or Kevin Paltran? Paltran? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they were one of them was a podcaster, which is very fitting for this. There you go. Yeah, right? you were my inspiration, Skid. Yeah, I know, but that you, I'm a little jealous that she has twenty thousand followers. That's uh, <laughs> aspirational for sure. Hopefully, uh, we'll uh, we'll get there ourselves. I uh, was so channeling you. So. <laughs> Thanks. Although I'm not sure. Uh, again, spoilers <laughs> that things turn out so well for the podcaster in your in your film. So talk more about sort of in the coming together and the editing. What scenes, you talked some about how the green screen, you guys adapted well. You talked about that restaurant where you didn't originally get the audio you wanted, you refilmed it. What other challenges did you have in the course of filming? What, what scenes or elements didn't go quite the way you thought they would? We had a couple of problems with the green screen beyond what I, the first one that I had. One was that the green screen was going to turn into the background, the car running down the highway and uh, the background zipping by. Well, one of the problems I discovered was that um, we filmed it the wrong direction. We just filmed it, but it was the wrong side of the car, so that when we put it on the green screen, the car looked like it was going the other way. <laughs> uh, so that was one problem. Another one was that a car went by. Uh, I guess we shot out the um, driver's side of the car for one of the shots, and a car went by, and we used that on one of the shots where we're, where we had the passenger with the green screen behind her. And when the car went by, it, it didn't make any sense that the car would go by on the passenger side. So we had to fix that. The little things like that, that if you, if you don't pay attention, you're gonna, you're gonna make a very odd movie. <laughs> I think for me, there was a couple things. Of course, Andrea already mentioned the restaurant scene. In my mind as the AD, I'm thinking, okay, do we have time to add a fifth location to this filming day. So, I mean, they really went ahead and filmed in the restaurant just in case, because we really didn't know if we were gonna have the time. And I said, let's just go ahead and get the, get the footage in case we need it. And this is just one of those cases where it's quality is just gonna be more important than necessarily finishing up filming by seven or 8 p.m. Um, and I'm really glad that we decided uh, to add a fifth location. And then also for me, just not having done this before, I, I'm not sure I even sent out a legitimate call sheet. And, but but it worked out okay. It wound up uh, not lasting too late. I think we were done by maybe 9 or 10 p.m., right? Yep. Well, the call sheet is a tool to get everybody 
what they're supposed to do. And if you actually get the filming, then that's good. Now, you didn't have to do a production report, right? That's uh, We have to summarize everybody's hours and what they get paid because it doesn't sound like there was a lot of pain going on with this. Not, you're not, not allowed to be one. paid. Ah, that's part of it as well. You're not allowed to hire folks to actually right, do you, it. You can hire, you can purchase um, equipment or uh, pay for permits, but you, nobody on the cast or crew is allowed. It has to be voluntary. Got it. One more challenge that I had was... Um, even though I, I feel like I rested more than uh, um, Quentin or Andrea because I wasn't necessarily uh, there for the editing, but I did go back the second day around 7 or 8 a.m. and because to add the music. And in such a short amount of time, you have to come up with something very simple. I didn't have time to come up with something elaborate or complicated. Um, so the music's very simple and we were able to purchase some music as well. One more challenge, which, um, I damaged Quentin's home deed document. It was, the movie is about a will. And so <laughs> there has to be a last will and testament. And we used, uh, Quentin had a, a legal document that looked like a last will and testament. And I just, I had, I used to be a calligrapher in high school. So I wrote on the on the document last will and testament and <laughs> Quentin sacrificed his his legally binding document for this short film and hopefully um, <laughs> that does not impact anything legally for him. So for that, that know, was... <laughs> the document was my mortgage. <laughs> it was a nice long page with lots of lots of uh, legalese in it. And I'm very happy to have it uh, destroyed or damaged because the mortgage has been paid off. <laughs> <laughs> what other elements did you guys bring into the, into the filming or either things you set aside at a time or, uh, you know, just again, pulling all these various elements together. What was it like uh, for you guys? We had a, we had a gun in the film. So one of the, well, it was a fake gun. Let me, let me, let me note that. Um, in the 48 hour film festival, when they said that we're looking for elements and props and that their required prop was a tape, if we decided to introduce any new elements, we had to be cognizant of if we introduce anything like a gun. And we, and they highly encouraged against the people using guns, but we used a gun and it was on a, on a farm and it was a fake gun, it was a toy gun. And so that was um, something that we had to take in mind, but nobody on the farm or any, anything cared, so. On the farm itself, I know there's some shots with the horses and such. Any problems with the animals? Did you have did you have folks from the farm wrangling your animals for the shots, or you guys were just sort of wandering around shooting stuff there? How'd that work? I think uh, I think it worked pretty well. The the horses are rescue animals, so they're all um, they've all had some trauma in their histories. But uh, the owner of the farm managed to find a horse that was pretty docile. And, but I believe it, at one point, maybe one of the shots, there was some horse talking going on in the background. So we couldn't use that. Uh, but otherwise, you know, the horse was uh, tied in, in the stable and uh, quite calm. So that wasn't really a problem. So Quentin, tell me more about the editing. You, you mentioned about fixing the green screen issues, but uh, what other elements did you have to work with in the editing room? One of the things that I really try to focus on is continuity between the shots and internally in a scene. And on the first day, the first scene, we had a shoot at the railroad tracks and we had the establishing shot and we had a series of, uh, you know, interview or not interviews, but uh, talking shots. And I thought we needed to put in an extra shot of, uh, of the car from a different angle running down, uh, driving down the road. And then I thought, oh, later on during the dialogue, um, one of the characters says that they couldn't get uh, road service for another day. And it seemed to me that something was missing between the time when the car stopped and the time he said he couldn't get road service. So we threw in um, another line of dialogue, a close up on the actor holding his phone, calling road service. Uh, and so that added that, that was the missing element that made the scene, I think, flow a little bit better. If I had time to storyboard, I think um, we would have done a little better with some of the shots and the directing. As a new director, I definitely struggled with trying to figure out some of the shots and I did a lot of research. I talked to you, I did a lot of um, some reading, some YouTube, um, but I, I would have liked to 
do those shoots over again and having reflected back on how I did them, I, I probably would have done them very differently now that I know what I know. Lessons learned. Brooke, what about you and your, uh, your sort of jack of all trades AD job you had over there? It sounds like you were doing a, besides keeping track of things and getting it scheduled, uh, a lot of other things fell under your responsibility. What lessons did you learn from the process? Well, I learned that when you're working with a small team and everyone's unpaid, that you just have to do what needs to be done in order for the film to be successful. And so, yeah, I mean, I was running around doing quite a few things, but everyone was, everyone was picking up the slack and even where maybe there was something I should have been doing that I didn't know I was supposed to do as the AD. Well, you know, someone else picked that up and I'm thankful that they did that as well. Okay. So Sunday evening, the film is edited. What happens next? I was driving um, from Quentin's house and driving the thumb drive and I was with Corey and I was, as I was driving, I was about, I was halfway again, uh, Quentin lived up in Maryland. I was driving into Georgetown. So lots of traffic, even though it was a Sunday night and Quentin calls me up and he says, I found a couple of things that I corrected. Can you come back? <laughs> and I said, well, we left at five or five thirty, trying to make the, trying to be there in time. We were giving ourselves at least an hour to be able to drive to the site. And I said, no, I can't drive back. How about I just continue to drive to Georgetown to the drop-off site and you come later and I will stay there because the deadline was 730. I will stay there until you arrive and I will switch thumb drives if we have time. So I arrived at the site and I was just hanging out, mingling, watching people come and go, people dropping off their thumb drives. Meanwhile, here I was holding onto my thumb drive, looking at the clock hoping that 7.30 was not going to roll around. And then Quentin calls me and it was like around seven something and says, I have, and then I rushed down the stairs. I rush out to the street and then we, we swap thumb drives and I take the new one, the revised version with the up correct corrections. And I rush back in and I think it was like 7.14 and I hand in the thumb drive and, and I said, now we, we can submit. The guy was looking at me. He was like, why are you holding on? I was like, well, we had some few corrections, but I didn't want to hand it in until we, um, until if we figuring out if we could actually have throw in this, throw in this revised thumb drive. This was a breeze this year. Last year when I did this, we, we had a tremendous problem rendering the movie. It took a long time to, to, uh, you know, pull it all together after the editing was over. And then, and we, we thought we weren't going to make it because it was seven o'clock and we're, I'm close to seven o'clock and it, we're probably 25 minutes away from where the drop-off point, 20 minutes away from the drop-off point. And fine, so we just left the guy that was doing the rendering alone in the room to do it by himself. And it's a little after seven, he handed us the drive and we raced down to the, to the drop off point. I got there, I got out of the car, they dropped me off. I, I got in the door at 725 and they locked the door five minutes later. The line was very long. So we got it in on time, it was, it was great. But then I discovered that my cell phone was out of battery power. So it died while I was waiting to drop off the film. And then I had no way to call an Uber to get home. So, <laughs> so I had to go down to the local motel and use their phone to call a, call a cab. <laughs> so to your point, I can imagine it is a competition. So it's only fair that they're extremely strict about everything being turned in on time. How, do you have any idea how many folks participated in at least at the DC location this year? This year was a record level. There were 71 or 72 people. And I believe last year, Quentin, there were 50 something. Yeah, some, something like that, around 60, I think, competed. Oh, and then, but only 54 actually turned in the films on time. Ah, so there's a couple of teams that end up actually not completing it. As you can imagine, you think about all the challenges folks have. Some, fo some films are going to fall by the wayside. Well, so they take these films and then what happens after that? They evaluate them, the judges look at them, and they announce the, I think, believe it was June 27th or June 28th, 
when they announced the, when they would roll all of the films and they would announce the, the winners for each of those, those films. And so you guys got to see your film on the big screen. Yes. It was exciting. Tell me more about that. What was exciting about that? Well, it was exciting for me because just to know that you worked on something and to just see it on the big screen for the first time as an, a newbie to the film industry, really. Just the satisfaction of knowing, wow, I worked on that and um, it was wonderful. Now, how did the will place as far as the competition aspects of the contest went? We got a couple of nominations, one for uh, our line of dialogue and two for the producer's award. And I think three, there was a third one. Can't remember what it was, but we didn't win anything. But for our first time, at least my first time, I thought that was, that was pretty cool. And it was pretty cool to see it on the big screen at the AFI in Silver Spring. I mean, as they say, it's an honor just to be nominated. That's uh, everybody knows that. So Congratulations on that front. And so the winners, though, from the city then go on to another competition. Is that right? Yes. Each, each city that participates in the competition has one winner that is entered into the next competition, the international competition, which I think this year is in Florida. Last year it was in Paris. Um, and, you know, so 125 uh, films are entered and judged. And I guess they do audience awards there, too. They have audience awards in the Washington um, exhibitions, too. Uh, And then they pick the winner and announce it. And they, uh, I guess, uh, the four four or five top uh, films are then shown at Cannes. So it uh, it has the potential for generating quite a lot of buzz and interest in your team if you do a good job. Well, speaking of the team and... uh... When you mentioned earlier wanting to find folks who had that you could work with again in the future. I understand you guys are working on another project now. Tell me a little about that and where things are in that process. Well, again, Andrea is the producer and director on this and writer. Um, but she uh, she's taken this uh, this ball and is running with it. You know, we did the 48 hour project in May. And now she's in August. She filmed. Uh, we all filmed together the uh, the next uh, next film, and I'll let Andrea talk more about that. It was very exciting and to hear that there was so much enthusiasm among the team, and they all were energized, regardless of how we placed. And even before the they announced the winners or even the nominations, everybody said, well, we want to do another one. We had a great, there was great team spirit, and people enjoyed working together. And they, they said, wow, I definitely want to do another one. And So I just started thinking about a screenplay and putting things together, putting some thoughts down together. And I said, here are my thoughts. Here's a screenplay. Who wants to, who wants to join? And uh, the crew was definitely on board. The cast was, um, I was going to audition cast members this time. There was a lot more time to start planning and the prep work. So we uh, were able to put together a, a casting call and we're not no longer constrained by the 48 hour film hour festival time limitations. So we, um, I did. A, I was able to do a lot more prep work and put things together and organize things. And Brooke was enthusiastic and eager with the um, now, now being a, a, a more uh, solid AD. Says I can do this, and using her skills as a composer to be able to do some more and have more time on that. And Quentin was enthusiastic as well and worked with one of the camera folks that we worked on on the last one and now we're in uh just finished filming as quentin mentioned and we're now in post so the project is a lot more ambitious in terms of um the visual effects uh this one's a futuristic sci-fi so there's a lot more into that than there was in the will and obviously with the will being a 48-hour film festival there's only so much you can do but this one i um I really let my creativity get the best of me and I jumped from by leaps and bounds in terms of I think my capabilities but everybody was enthusiastic and interested in participating on on this one and they were eager about the topic and so that made me it was a feel a good feeling. So I know when we're airing this film won't have been released yet what what is the name of the film that we should be watching for down the line? On Gardula. On Gardula and you said it's a sci-fi Epic, how long, how long a film is this? Are we feature length? How long, how long a film are you guys putting together? It's a short, it's 16 minutes. 
there was some debate as to how to pronounce Gardula. Is it Gardula? <laughs> Is it Gardula? Is it Gardula? But during our table read, we had a, we, we, given the fact that we did have more time, we had a table read with the actors and some of the actors had their own thoughts as to how to pronounce the name and the title of the film. And the Gardula is, or Gardula, is the name of the planet. And so there was some deliberation among the actors and a couple of the crew members and we came up with Gardula. Gardula is the name, is how it's pronounced again. <laughs> and so that's going to be consistent or is Quentin, is that something that you're going to have to fix in post as well? The well pronunciation you know, we did of... <laughs> have a couple of scenes where the actors mispronounced it. We had to reshoot. We couldn't use that take. <laughs> Short film, but what do you, how long do you say? 15, 16 minutes now? Is that uh, longer? So quite a bit. And then other elements, you're adding visual effects and such. Tell me more about what else you guys have, have brought in for this second project. Well, this is very ambitious because we've got a lot of green screen shots. The backgrounds are going to be futuristic landscapes and and spaceships and interior spaceships and that kind of thing. So we had to be pretty pretty uh, high quality on the lighting of the green screen and positioning of the actors so they didn't fall off the green screen. We're we're having to do a lot of corrections in post because we didn't film it exactly right in every every shot. So we'll have to, you know, uh, zoom in a little bit tighter on some of the actors to avoid extraneous uh, items in the shot or put in masks to mask out some of the things that we didn't want in there. So it's a much more time consuming process when you have to do that. Now in the film in itself, did you have a larger crew on this one? Did you bring in additional folks? There were quite a few additional folks that were brought in. Um, we had a production assistance, which we didn't have in the will. We had production assistance for the uh, camera department. We had a vis we brought in a visual effects artist and we had a larger cast. We had much, many, uh, quite a few more actors who participated in, in this one than the last one. More extras, more people who had speaking roles. It was just a bigger story to tell. Now, Brooke, were you the assistant director again on this project? I was, and I think I, I did a I done a much better job this time. I I researched everything I needed to do and put together a legitimate call sheet, and we were on time and on target. And I think uh, we didn't compromise quality just because um, you know we were trying to make sure we were on schedule. And so, how many days of filming were for the uh, on Gardula? So we only had two days of filming and uh, we wanted to make the best use of the people as far as uh, scheduling when we were going to do the scenes and what locations uh, for each day. And it just, it worked out really well. Um, I think we also had a, a makeup artist for this as well. And so just scheduling hair and makeup beforehand and making sure everyone was on the set on time was somewhat challenging, uh, at least for the first day, but it, it worked out. I mean, when we were running late for some scenes and locations, we made it up at others. So it worked out. I made sure everyone was fed well too. <laughs> yeah, Brooke did a great job of that. Everybody was very well fed. And we also had a set designer too. So we had a couple more people that we didn't have in our last one. And there was a little bit of a budget for this one as well. Other uh, lessons you learned as director, Andrea, for the second film? How, how, did, how do you change your techniques, if at all? You talked about doing some things differently. How'd that apply for the second film for you? I felt like I repeated some of the same mistakes that I did last time, not because I wanted to, but it was, they were just accidents in terms of shooting. I did learn how to, um, I didn't have the opportunity to, I didn't have the time to storyboard in the last one, but this one I had more time to storyboard. And Lessons learned would definitely be to have more time in working with the camera, both the camera and the director of photography. Um, the two individuals just going over the storyboards and how to shoot those scenes. We went to each of the locations this time and identified how we would lay out the shots. But I think we could have done that a little bit more and I probably should have storyboarded ahead of time 
for each of those locations, not either storyboarding as I'm at those locations or storyboarding after recording what we discussed that day. So then I could hand to the DP what, um, what we agreed on. And I definitely would like to do that next time just to set more time aside with the, with the camera just to lay out those shots. Well, as this comes together, I know you're still finishing the editing and the uh, extensive special effects. Are you guys looking ahead for the project after this? So um, I'm moving to California and things are a little up in the air for me, but I'm also going to be um, working with the visual effects artist, Dedo, who joined the, our team for On Gar Gardula. Uh, he wants to do a, a feature film, so I'm helping out with producing some of the, um, the elements for that. I'm working on a, uh, uh, maybe it's a pipe dream, but it's a documentary about uh, the, one, of the, one of the early uh, champions of manufacturing. Um, which is what I was involved in for my career. So I'm working on the research and pu pulling together information about um, the head of the post serial company back in the early 1900s. So, and I'm also doing a home movie uh, called A Ghost Story. It's about a ghost and how that ghost terrorizes the family. And Brooke, what about you? What's your future film plans? Well, I'm probably going to continue my day job, <laughs> but... Um, I, I don't have any future film plans right now. I really, um, Andrea is a great friend of mine and I want her to just make it big in LA. Uh, and if, I don't know if she would ever want me to work on a, a film again with her, I definitely would. I'm a, one of her biggest fans. I think she's an incredible uh, screenplay. Uh, she, she writes incredible screenplays. I, she has a North Cor a script on North Korea, and I really hope that <laughs> that gets made into a movie very soon because it's so timely. Someone make this movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm just going to support her in any way I possibly can. If I make it out in LA within a heartbeat, I would hire everybody, almost everybody on the crew. Definitely Quentin, Brooke, Dedo. I worked so well with everybody that I would would love to be able to bring them on in some capacity if I were fortunate enough to be able to make films professionally out in LA. Well, with all you guys moving on, but let's go back again to the 48 hour film festival. If folks heard this and they're inspired to participate in the festival themselves next year, wherever city they're in, what advice would you give folks? What should they think about ahead of time? What were the most important things just to execute on that 48 hour film? I would definitely think about um, doing the team meetings, having a couple of team meetings before the actual day of game day uh, in terms of having with the cast and crew and just having everybody making sure everybody knows what's going on and uh, laying some sort of plan out, discussing the locations and um, making sure there's a good team vibe. I know that's really hard to do with people you don't know, but Having those team meetings, I think, is a good way, a good opportunity for people to get to know each other, even if it's a short amount of time, even if it's for an hour. But um, it really helps set the expectations for the day when you're going to start the contest. Yeah, I agree. When we put together the first team that I did last year, um, the hardest part for me was finding people that... Um, to to work with together on the thing uh so we needed cast and crew and through the networking i was able to find a couple people here and a couple people there i found a couple of friends and but once we got it all together and had our team meetings and and people got so enthusiastic about it uh, it's a short time commitment for most of the people on the on the project and one guy one of the actors came at eight in the morning on saturday and was there all day waiting for his chance to be, you know, to say his one line. And uh, I asked him, you know, is this how you feel about all this, waiting for so long? And he said, no problem at all. I love watching this. This, you know, please invite me back. I'll do it again. So the enthusiasm on these teams is just infectious. And it really makes it worthwhile to put them together and, and complete the projects. I will note again that the actors were very dedicated. There were times when I felt bad that it was too hot or Brooke was patting them down to make sure that they weren't going to die or have a heart attack. And I was concerned about their health, but they said, no, no, did, was that take good? And I was like, well, it was, it was good. And they said, Can, do you want another one? I was like, 
I, I would like another one. And they just said, they, I had them saying to me, we would want another one. When I felt bad that they were going through the, through the motions during a very, very hot day. Brooke, what advice would you give your earlier self or someone who tasked with the logistics of these things? So the advice I would give is do your research, know your role, also be prepared to pitch in when you see something that needs to be done, prepare for the unexpected, and maintain a good attitude through it all. I think there is some either in, on, our, on Gardula some of the behind the scenes footage, my facial expressions are very frustrated and you can see that. And so um, Andrea and Quentin has made, have made fun of me quite extensively for that. We have not made fun of you. <laughs> <laughs> and also I will say that last night, this, this is funny. You can keep this or not, but last night, Andre and I were at a house concert and this guitarist said he'd been work, working on, uh, a song for 10 years. And I just looked at her and I said, it might take me 10 years to finish composing the music for On Guard Duel. <laughs> and, and she, she looks at me and she says, it better not. Between <laughs> you and Quentin and Dedo, this needs to be done by the end of October. Are you all three are going to wind up in a ditch? <laughs> I did not say that. Okay, that I actually said by December. <laughs> <laughs> all right well I got, i've got to go I, now i got some editing to do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like everybody's got work to pull this film together definitely uh i hope that comes together let us know how it goes for folks who want to go back again and watch the will i'll say it one more time vimeo.com backslash three four one four seven three two oh nine that's three four one four seven three two oh nine Six minutes long. Uh, it's worth taking a look. You can see how, uh, as we talked about these elements, various elements for the project played out. Um, and in general, uh, folks, it was a lot of fun talking this through. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks, kid. Listeners, love to hear what you thought of the episode. You can send email to skid, S-K-I-D, at blow the line, one word, dot biz. That's B-I-Z. I also appreciate your feedback via iTunes, where I review your ratings and comments, and Facebook where I post photos and other behind-the-scenes materials. You can find the Facebook at podcast below the line. Please do rate us and tell your friends. As mentioned earlier in the show, you can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram. On both platforms, you can find us at pod below the line. Thanks to Curtis Five for our music and John Juan for our logo. The logo is available on t-shirts, mugs, and stickers at redbubble.com. Thanks again for listening. Hope you join us again soon. So really, Andrea, are you going to put your crew in a ditch? Is this really what you threaten them with if they don't get this done? <laughs> she did. She said it. <laughs> I didn't say that, but I was like, <laughs> I'm not going to put anybody in a ditch. <laughs> All right. It was good to know, for the record. Thanks, kid. <laughs>